it's me, Ryan, doing another movement organizing stream from Somatica, my Feldenkrais practice located on Treaty 7 territory in the land colonized as Canada. In my Thursday movement organizing live streams, I work with themes that might be of general interest to the somatic educator and probably people in general, but um, working closer to the somatics nerd um, market out there. And um, so today I'm going to um, briefly catch myself up on um, my background knowledge and experience um, following this the subject of what is the individual, the actual um, ontological status of the individual, the, the question of what are individuals in reality? Um, because um, there's many, we'll say, cultural trappings associated with the idea of the individual in, in most cultures that are um, uh, most people that are like speaking English and, and capable of, you know, easily following what I'm saying are familiar with this idea of the individual and we all we all think we know what we we mean by it um but uh and cer certainly in the biological sciences um the idea of an individual in for example population genetics or ecology um has a has its own meaning has a, a fairly clear meaning and that meaning is maybe close to the economic sense of an individual because the disciplines have in common this quantification, this attempt to describe the actual dynamics of the actual life histories of organisms. So there are these, these entities, these quanta in those systems that are called individuals. But to say that those concepts are the actual scientific consensus on the individual would be a gross overstatement. For example, in the biological sciences, the, the question of individuality shows up in very simple ways when one's looking at um, organisms that live in a, in a eusocial fashion, organisms like ants and termites, bees, well, not all of the bees, and perhaps not all the, the termites and ants either. There are many of them. But these organisms are characteristically eusocial. They live in large colonies where um, there's only one um, individual in the whole colony. Um, there's only one, um, say I just said individual, there's only one insect in the whole colony that is reproductive, at least over most of the life cycle of the colony. And then um, reproductive males are only only produced over a limited period, and they don't actually like integrate into the colonies. They're they're produced for leaving the colony, and mating with other um, fertile uh, queens uh, that have been released from other colonies, and then starting new colonies with those. Well, well, no, and then dying. Those males then dying, and the the fertilized queens starting their their next colonies. Um, so genetically, these colonies are a single organism. And 
they're individuals that are competing with each other on the the life history scale of of the the queens there are use social organisms that as i understand it can replace their queens an aging queen can can actually be replaced and so you can think of the colonies then as having a kind of identity that persists individually independently of the life of the queen and so even those types of social organisms have their own subtleties and refinements to the point that i was just trying to make which is that they challenge the the basic ideas about individualism the the presence of these super organisms or collectives of individual insects that act like um, individuals in terms of genetics, in terms of collective behavior. There's other interesting examples. Um, I think maybe I can get a nice slime mold video to play in the background. Yeah, I mean, if I play any copyright content, right, that's going to start triggering things. And I guess I don't want to step in it. Well, here we go. Let's go to the Berkeley website. And so slime molds are right on the boundary of unicellular and multicellular organisms because they have parts of their life history where they're individual cells that don't interact with each other. And then, um, well, at least in these cellular slime molds, um, they have uh, an option to, at some point in their life history, find each other, actually assemble into mating structures and form whole, whole larger organisms. Doesn't look like... Um, they're going to hook us up with any particularly beautiful movies. Oh, well. There's our introduction from the Berkeley website. Well, this is just... Uh, that's not very good. Slime mold, time mold. Well, I've wasted already too much time, but slime molds are nice examples of challenges to the, the kind of ideas of multicellularity. Anyway, so um, I, I first became aware of Michael Gislin because of an argument, a public argument he had with a, um, um, an evolutionary scholar named uh, Ayala, Francis Ayala, um, Gislin, Gislin Ayala. So they're, they're, public debates about teleology, tele teleological explanations. Um, of course, uh, yeah, most of these articles I can't get at very easily anymore. If I have copies, I need to like dig them up and yeah. But um, uh, here's, um, the original um, contribution from, I guess, Francis Ayala, Teleological Explanations in Evolutionary Biology in 1970. And there is a series of refinements of the terminology around the, the phrase teleology, including the, the coining of the phrase teleonomy. Um, so, um, yeah, we don't need to get into that right now, actually, because... Um, 
Um, it's a large other subject related to the definition of biological functions that um, I previously have introduced and um, I'm, I've yet to sort of publicly complete. Um, but uh, arguing with uh, Ayala was where I first noticed um, Michael Gislin um, responding. Responding to Ayala. Um, this is a that's a a backwater. This is interesting. The title says, what does Gislin mean by individual? It looks like it's by a Joseph Kruskal with no abstract. And then the thing provided here is an article by Michael Gislin from 1981, uh, a different thing. So this is quite confusing. It looks like the wrong preview or... Hmm. That's strange. Anyway, um, I really respected uh, Michael Gislin's work as I started to follow the person. Um, for starts, he was one of the first uh, MacArthur scholars. Here's from the MacArthur Foundation. Um, so he's one of the first awarded um, people, class of 81. Um, and uh, so at this time, he had already made a quite a quite a contribution. Um, It's a, a very good book, a very well done book called The Triumph of the Darwinian Method um, that uh, Gislin contributed in uh, 1970. And um, yeah, it got him a MacArthur Genius Award. Besides his other contributions, um, The one of the great contributions of this book and and Gislin's Dar Darwin scholarship is the focus on the actual process that Darwin used and the, the linkages between Darwin's observations as a naturalist and the. Um, proposal and refinement of his theories, his ex explanatory models for how his observations can be reconciled together. And um, it's just crystal clear. It's just a crystal clear. Oh, sorry, 1973 is when it was first published. I just, I can, I can refine that. But yeah, so the MacArthur Award was after um, this really fantastic book. If you get your hands on it, um, um, uh, I really recommend this, this highly readable survey of, of what Darwin actually did, how his thinking came together. And so everyone, everyone and their, um, everyone can, uh, cartoon the, the, Dar like theories of Darwinian evolution as survival of the fittest or something like that. And those are, as you probably know, um, I often explain that those are very limited 
cartoons. Cartoons are very limited uh, quality. Um, even in just describing the evolutionary theory, they're quite insu quite insufficient in describing what, what Darwin actually proposed. Um, but but this book shows how explaining atolls, the formation of atolls, the observation of coral reefs, and how they, they geologically, over geological time, they plausibly contributed to these patterns. Um, and Darwin synthesizes this, writes it up, communicates it, refines it over time. And it's just one example of this thing that Gislin's calling the Darwinian method. Oh yeah, I should I should motivate this a little bit better by even pointing out that almost everyone thinks of the scientific method as first of all existing, which is its own point of debate, and then um, being Baconian, really being um, based on the the template um, from who is it Fr Francis Bacon, Sir something Bacon, the Baconian flavor of the scientific method um, that we all we all learn as more or less the scientific method so you you take observations and from them you make a hypothesis and then you, you set up a you set up an experiment and then based on the experiment you um, support or invalidate the hypothesis and then you refine your your theory and you from your refined theory you you propose a new um a new hypothesis to be evaluated and that 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 approach especially testing your your hypothesis using quantitative measures that whole thing was was proposed well first first made famous if not proposed by by that bacon guy so that isn't science that's at most one flavor of the scientific method or one n narrowing of the scientific program. And um, it really doesn't correspond to what Darwin did, for example. So you either have to say that Darwin wasn't really being very scientific or you have to acknowledge what people like Firebend and other philosophers of science would say, which is that there isn't necessarily a, a method to science that's its own question um really the the whole point is that the natural world and the experiment is the arbiter of what's true in the in the natural sciences and so the process for getting there doesn't have to be clean or linear or even rational and that's the actual reality of the history of science um, is that you get you get to the facts in all kinds of haphazard ways some some of which are very non-methodical. My own contributions as a scientist were were um, uh, I think I, I think I learned enough rigor to make contributions that were of sufficient quality to count as valid contributions in the Baconian program. But I wouldn't say it was my natural mode. Um, I was you know much more interested in walking around with um, um, a much, much more creative approach where um, I had my own pet hypotheses and I knew I was biased towards them. And I was looking around um, for, for things to fit together um, and then trying to disprove, like, like letting, my, letting my biases set things up for me and then knowing that's what's happening and trying to disprove that program, so very, very falsificationist, very pop, pop, popper, popper oriented. But my way of generating ideas was definitely not Baconian, and um, of a kind with Darwin. But I think that would be incorrect too. I think Darwin was more methodical, maybe had a better work ethic. Um, uh yeah hard to say um but anyway enough talking about me and the science career which is now in the well 
hasn't been funded for a while, let's say. It is now uh, very much on the back burner. Um, so, so Michael Gislin and Michael Gislin takes a, an idea from the philosopher David Hall, um, it, which is a uh, in relation to the the species problem. And again, I, I come to this thinking from studying a, a relative offshoot, like like side sideshow distraction on the Gislin um, canon, which is his his arguments with uh, Ayala over over teleology um, in biology. Um, but his he's much more rightly um, appreciated for the the individual individual individuality thesis. So the topic is the species problem. Species problem. What is a species? So, and it's uh, David Hall So Mike Gislin, the individuality thesis. I think that's what they call it. So, um, and you can roughly, you can roughly um, summarize this proposal, the individuality thesis says um, the species is the the, bio, the biological individual, the actual individual unit. And here, biological is my own shorthand. So, so um, maybe I should put scare quotes around it. And by it, I mean, um, or they mean, um, taxonomic unit, um, but also um, Well, maybe I should look up more so because I'm already getting concerned that I'm not even summarizing that properly. So, so there's some some contributions are, are in the whole whole part relationship. Um. Um, so organisms organisms of the same species. parts of the same whole. Well, that got crammed in there. But yeah, that's my, that's what I can kind of remember. And after like looking at a couple web pages and getting kind of 
primed again on it. But so for example, in a multicellular organism, the part whole relationship cell the cell to the to the organism. And so the organism to the species is then in a similar part whole relationship. And so at some point of time, there is a cell some three or so billion years ago, and then It divides and divides and divides and divides and, and its descendants are in different environments. And the interesting thing is, how can you tell from what I'm drawing here what the time what the axis is if I'm drawing species radiating out in geologic time, or if I'm showing the the populations that descend from an ancestor cell? And we've got like a population of some 25 or 50 cells after, I don't know, eight or so rounds of cell division. How do we know the difference here? And why would the difference produce differing progeny versus different species? This is... The, the essence of the species problem is that what Darwin and, and what the ancient naturalists saw was that organisms vary from each other and they do it spontaneously, that the, the offspring of an animal were not identical to it. And well before um, the unit of life on Earth, the cell, had been um, identified uh, by the uh, ancient um, philosophers, at least the ones that are connected to me, to my knowledge tradition. Um, none of them were aware of this this foundational unit of life called the cell. And so definitely looking at the larger organisms, there is no reason whatsoever for thinking that everything comes out identically. But the incredible similarity of progeny to their parents wasn't lost on people and that for a lamb to be born to a wolf family or the other way around was understood to be um, a biological impossibility uh, by ancient cultures because, of course, they, they didn't observe contradictions. And I shouldn't speak for all the knowledge traditions because the appearance of contradiction surely presented itself, and I don't want to dismiss whatever insights resulted from looking at that phenomena. However, you can follow this, this train of thought, hopefully, that each, each event here is either a cell division time axis is hours or speciation time axis is well We'll say at least 
I think even in laboratory scale, even for unicellular life, hundreds or thousands of hours are appropriate for thinking about speciation. So yeah, let's say let's say it's over over ten to the four hours as a minimum for speciation, with of course geologic time being a more appropriate scale. But the point is that it's quite different. At minimum. At minimum this this time scale is radically different. We're just watching things branch in time. The so-called um, natural selection, this Darwinian mode of evolution, not the only Darwinian mode of evolution, but one of importance in terms of the originality of it is this idea that the individuals vary from each other. Let's say that the um, horizontal, sorry, the vertical axis here represents some different characteristic between these things. Um, it would make sense that um, if there is no difference in the environment between all these individuals, that you find the different characteristics um, in different locations just scattered, scattered randomly. So that if you ordered them vertically by characteristic here, um, it wouldn't give you any information about where they're located. There would be no relationship between the things. But let's say way way back in, in geologic time or microgeologic time, um, we've got Um, a different environment is introduced. See, at this point, see, at this point, yeah. At this point, the cells migrate into a different environment. So, Is a different different environment, and it's a different, say, micro environment. But what happens is that it's at at this point there was a key a key chance event that made it so that uh, the descendants of this branch point here are adapted for this slightly different environment and do well. And the descendants of this other branch point continue to do just fine outside of that environment. But if those descendants migrate into the environment, then those lineages um, get extinguished. They're, they don't compete as well. They, they um, lack um, competitive advantage in these environments. And so the, the whole branch for that point gets selected out. And so what started as a spontaneous variation interacts with its environment to get captured and um, starts to produce um, a difference. Now, what makes this difference accumulate into a speciation event is not a small question. That's close to what Darwin was interested in calling the species problem. What do we actually mean by species and how does it relate to this, this process that we've described here or, or analogous processes? Why is it that um, a Great Dane and a center poodle and a dachshund are all considered domestic dogs, but a wolf is considered a different species, not Canis domesticus, but Canis lupus. Canis, stupid Latin.
One might think that in The Origin of Species, that Darwin actually defines what a species is. But Darwin's very clear that um, he is not going to define what a species is. Um, I'm not going to find the quote for you. But um, if you're interested, you can um, let me know. One of these many places this is streaming to. I'll eventually notice where you mentioned it, and we can talk. Um, but it's obviously to me, it's obvious to me anyway, that this question of what a species is, is tremendously consequential. Uh, if you just look at the sort of time course from the Victorian period where people like Darwin were um, making these these connections between the evolution of life, the, the, the tree of life, and the, the, the history of the earth itself, the geological sciences, and, and putting together the the basic information that comes to make the original synthesis of um, paleontology, and I don't really know what you call the the whole whole kit and caboodle, you know, e evolutionary biology and and Earth history are the same thing. There aren't many rocks on the Earth's surface, for example, that aren't formed through the interaction of biological biologically produced materials and abiological processes coming together. Life's been around for, for so long that it's a long time even compared to the, the time scales of geological processes. So the history of Earth itself and the history of life on Earth are the same thing. Um, getting a little off topic. Right, like how could I be on topic? But the individuality um, um, thesis is that um, without without establishing all the criteria of what makes two species different from each other, two two organisms, what makes them in two different species is. Um, um, a different measure, a, di a different, a slight, it's a related question, but the actual thing, the homo, the homo sapien thing is understood as um, being the whole branch That's characterized by this by this event, by this by this distinction that occurred that allowed one population of organisms to have a different identity. And what makes this group have a different identity, calling it reproductive isolation, which is like the popular definition of what makes something a species, it, it's just a... Uh, it's convenient and it's a powerful explanation that's proposed by biologists and it works for a lot of areas, but it, it doesn't work for a lot of things. There's a lot of examples of neighboring species being able to hybridize, produce not just hybrid offspring, but viable hybrid offspring. And so the species being in more of a continuum, it's appropriate for a lot of, a lot of organisms. A lot of organisms look like they're different species because they live in the same place and they have different 
behavior and and um, an appearance, but under laboratory conditions, you can show that mating between one one group and another group, it's possible and viable offspring occurs. So it's only behavior or ge geographic separation that's leading to this this biological isolation of these two different species. And so if you think about it then, can we really picture spontaneous matings between like a Shawala and a Great Dane? Like, is that actually physically possible? And if those two breeds of dogs can't actually complete the, the, the breeding spontaneously without some artificial assistance, then is it still right to call them members of the same species? That, that problem goes away if one stops looking at essentializing reproduction as the key behavior that makes things a species, but rather this, this question of shared identity. Here's David Hall's paper from 1976. Is that right? Is this the original? How fun. Yeah, Systematic Zoology from 1976. Hey, we found it online. Oh, I guess it's Hall and Gislin. I thought Hall sent the idea over to Gislin, but it looks like they did it together more because Hall starts off by acknowledging Gislin. The species as chunks of genealogical nexus are individuals, not classes of similar things. Their names are proper names as you find ostensibly in a matter analogous to a christening. <laughs> so the argument has two parts. The first is that the basic unit of classification must be some basic unit of evolution. Some, which I think almost all, I, that's, that seems to be a, a, most people seem to agree that the correct, the correct naming scheme recapitulates the life history of the tree of life itself. Some biologists disagree that it's so hard to reconcile the relationship between data and um, and theory and inference, so um, you could be more neutral for classification. But like I said, yeah, most most biologists and myself agree that the right classification scheme. Um, is uh, evolutionary um, in some sense. So then um, the second part of Gislin's argument depends on a particular view of meaning and definition. On this view, the names of individuals are proper names and as such have no meaning in the sense that the terms like triangle, gold, and game do. They are meaningless identification tags and nothing else. They have no verbal definitions, no intentions. The twist which Gislin adds to the usual story is that the names of particular species are proper names because species are individuals. And so they're not categories. So I'm not an example of, of a human being. I'm a part of the phenomena called Homo sapiens. Can you see the distinction? Can you feel the distinction? 
maybe let it soak in for a moment. I am not a member of the class of organisms called Homo sapiens. I am not a person because I'm an example of a kind of person. I am a part of the whole, and that whole thing is called humanity. Or Biologically speaking, Homo sapiens, this thing that occurs, what, up to a half million years ago now? They keep pushing it back. How old we really are. Definitely upper dates are now around 300,000 years, I think. So, yeah, that rereading re just a few words of David Hall summarizing Mike Islin. Um, it's this category idea versus this holistic idea. And so the, the individuality of people in the conventional sense, it remains like a reality in the sense that the individuality of cells retain their, their, it's still a thing that makes coherent sense to talk about individual cells. But um, But coming up with a, a meaningful way to make all the body of humanity, um, all the body of, of, of life, um, meaningfully organized into these, these units that have names. It's um, not just nerd work for scientists because... The culture here matters. When people absorb the idea that there are elements in a category, then the sameness that unites us all has a kind of dull, unmagical feel to it. There's something... homogenizing about treating each person as cut from the same cloth. And our common humanity can be, um, especially in our hyper-individualist, competitive, liberal capitalist framework, I say our, meaning that we all live under it or adjacent to it. The the individuality thesis that treats all of us is part of the same individual event doesn't specify that the parts are all identical to each other. In the same way that saying that I'm made of trillions and trillions of cells by no means flattens me out into a slime mold that has barely differentiated cells from each other, some of them specializing in 
holding together the others and some of them specializing in making reproductive structures, spores and the like. It would be ridiculous to say that thinking of myself as a grouping of cells reduces my, my physiological and anatomical complexity and flattens it into nothing. Can you see how impoverished that view would be if one thought that to accept my cellularity is to reduce myself to a lump of meaningless cells that are stuck together? That, that's, that's not a clever criticism. That's an impoverished view of the situation. It's, a, it's miraculous that the facts remain that it is cell division and programmed cell death, um, the differentiation over time, the assimilation of resources that turns one lump of goo that's undifferentiated into a bunch of structures that are very much specialized in doing specific things. That's the correct story. That's simply what it is to be a multicellular organism. And so the undifferentiated goo is itself a fiction. To be multicellular is to be differentiated, to have cells that know to specialize and to do different things in different places at different times. And it's true for the smallest multicellular things to the largest ones. Maybe not at all phases of the life cycle, but there's no reason to be multicellular if you're not going to differentiate. Maybe... Maybe there's better theories of the animal than the one that I'm thinking of, but you're probably you're probably familiar with this this kind of proto embryology idea. You have one cell, then you have two cells, and then after some time, after some time, you have a clump of cells. One cell. One, two, a lump. When you have your lump of cells that are all identical to each other. And so the, the value of being a lump isn't that clear at this point, because if they were all separated, they would have more access to things like nutrients, have more, more target to run for, for things to run into. So yeah, like, why be multicellular if you're just going to be a lump? Well, it turns out that there's reasons. Like, there's biofilms, and, and lumps can be very useful for even simple organisms like this. But getting, getting a little to the point that the, the value of being a lump only starts to emerge when the amount of cells is, is, is getting to be quite large so that first I'll make my, my big lump or kind of so this is a, a big lump big lump and now now there's um now space matters now. Now there's a radial direction that makes sense because the cells on the inside have a different local environment than the cells on the outside. So there's this radial direction, radiality, radial, radial direction 
gets defined when you have a big lump of cells because there's an inside in there's an inside and an outside. I'm gonna write it out over here. Inside and outside space. Once there's an inside and an outside space, you can imagine specialization being helpful. Well, just think like there's a lot of chemical reactions that that go very well in the presence of oxygen, especially those ones that use oxygen as a reactant. And then there's a lot of chemical reactions which are poisoned by the presence of oxygen. Oxygen actively inhibits those reactions. Um, and so, just by having an inside and an outside, you could have the things on the inside specializing in the in the processes that don't work well in oxygen and the things on the outside specializing in processes that do work well with oxygen, for example. Um, and so no reason why your big lump needs to be made of cells of one species, except that it's easy to get them all there at the same time if they're formed from dividing. But you can imagine the things specializing on the inside coming from a different genetic lineage. And this idea that the reproductive history needs to be kind of well contained to the finest species is itself not a, a useful assumption in biology. See the lichens, right? The whole, there's a whole group of things, you know, what species, what species is this lichen? Is one of those weird questions from the taxonomic perspective because every every lichen is uh, some kind of bacterial thing plus a fungal thing. Lichen, so it's like species one and species two gives you species three or one plus two, or what is, what's the situation here? David Hall, Michael Gislin, they don't have a ready-made answer for this. Maybe it's a problem of sort of the habits of human thinking and not necessarily a problem for biology at all. But certainly there are different kinds of lichens and they're systematically formed by particular species and particular, sorry, particular bacteria and particular fungi coming together and forming this partnership. So multicellularity um, involves these whole part relationships and produces these entities that have identities that um, mean something, but what they mean in terms of um, biological, like uh, reproductive continuity, that's not necessarily um, a clear, a clear way to follow things through. It's just a convenient one for, for a lot of the, are the situations that people like to think about. People like to think about the problems they can make progress on, not necessarily the things that are the important things. So this clump of cells that we just, um, this big clump of cells that has an inside and an outside, it can, you can imagine it eventually um, forming larger structures where there's an actual wall of cells, for example. Well, it's a sphere of cells. Sphere O cells. It's a sphere of cells. Um, and so now there's an, in, there's an inside and an outside. And the cells here can be in, for example, layers. So you could have cells that know that they're facing the outside, cells that are on the inside in the middle, and cells that are facing the inside. And all these things could be 
specializing, doing different processes, the things that face the inside could be accumulating things in that environment that change it and stabilize it in a way that the outside space can't be stabilized. So you're beginning to create um, um, a kind of body space. And the actual sort of developmental biology of a, a human embryo or really an animal embryo, um, this actual inside space that's developed very early from this clump of cells is not the body space of the organism proper, but is the amnion. Okay, well, in the amniotic uh, animals anyway, or yeah, right, yeah, in the in the uh, placental, in the placental ones. Um, well, actually, I don't know my my embryology well enough to talk about which animals this applies to very well, um, but. Um, this actual bubble here is going to be more the um, the uh, yeah the fluid filled space that the baby's in um, the amniotic fluid the amnion the amniotic sac the amniotic sac is this actual thing and these this streak of cells that are pointed on the inside or the middle or on the outside form the um, ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm tissues. Um, so this this will become, this is like the, um, oh, even, even that's not quite right. Yeah, so actually what will happen is first you have the inside space and the outside space defined in something like the marula stage. And then this thing will flatten so that from the side, it looks more like a figure eight that's kind of pinching together. So, and then, yeah. So then this makes a, a sandwich then of three layers. There's one, one layer here that becomes ectoderm. One layer here becomes endoderm. And uh, the cells in the middle, middle become the mesoderm. I think that's the origin of the, the actual primitive streak. Um, yeah. The point is that um, having different directions in space defined, um, having different functions for the different parts of this multicellular organism, it comes from um the same cell the same genetics as it reproduces producing itself different little environments which then stabilize the growth of different specialized um the expression of different specialized subprograms of the genetics of that organism um so that you wind up with a whole thing that has parts that each look and function differently. Um, so each cell is part of the same, of the whole organism, and the identity of each cell is, in a sense, the same. Each cell is, each cell of me is Ryan Hoffman fully. No cell of me is not Ryan Hoffman. The identity of all these parts um, can only be mapped onto the, the identity of the whole. But there's no there's no debate at all that if I scratch off some skin cells and send them off into the world, that even though those are little flakes of Ryan Hoffman that are going out into the world, that the whole part relationships that actually matter, they haven't been they haven't been disrupted. So some individual units of the whole have been removed from it. But it hasn't changed the identity status of the whole itself because these were always just parts of it. So in the same way, the if if one snuffs out my entire life and Ryan Hoffman doesn't exist anymore, then it's not that Homo sapien stops existing, just this very small part of Homo sapien. And so we're all part of the same event, the same story, the same moment of biological time, of geological time called the homo sapien, the knowing man.
Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about this individuality thesis, Gislin and Hall. We're not parts of a category. We're not, sorry, we're not instances of a category. We're parts of a whole. It's great this isn't a hard article to find. Are species really individuals? David Hall, you can find it. Looks like some uh, is this actually a quote from David Hall? No. I want a David Mitchell quote. Okay, wasting time. Hey, that's part of what we do in the live stream slots. A couple hours of indulging myself in a, in a, hopefully in a in a way which um, people can follow along a little bit with and maybe enjoy themselves. Um, if you have thoughts about um, anything I talked about today, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I teach tonight at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. I'm not sure if I'm continuing that time slot um, into next month, uh, solving that problem well today. So, uh, yeah, let me know um, what you're interested in, and take care out there.